Imagine a huge dark piece of cloth hung over your entire body like you were a shameful statue. That is an excerpt from the poem Under the Burqa by the playwright formerly known as Eve Ensler. It was recited by Oprah Winfrey on February 10th, 2001 in front of 18,000 people who had paid $1,000 per ticket to attend a Vagina Monologues Gala event. They then witnessed Winfrey remove a blue shuttlecock burqa from an Afghan activist. That was eight months before the invasion of Afghanistan. There isn't a better summary of over 20 years of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan than that. An exorbitantly expensive spectacle of salvation and dehumanization using the body of the Afghan woman as a front. It also sums up what U.S. coverage of Afghanistan has looked like for over two decades. For the women of Afghanistan, the veil, the burqa, has become the symbol of the Taliban's power. How long does the military think it will take them to finish the job that they came there to do in terms of Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? Hundreds of women, many in burqas, gathered at a wedding hall to implore officials to find a kidnapped American aid worker. For the first time, hitting the Taliban where it hurts, targeting the drug labs that double as money machines for the insurgency. With the Taliban seizing power, the fate of Afghan women and girls hangs in the balance, as do hard-fought freedoms and rights. In its coverage of Afghanistan, the U.S. media has tightly held hands with U.S. foreign policy, helping justify an invasion born in large part out of the fog of vengeance following the 9-11 attacks. And so when we closely examine American media coverage of Afghanistan from the invasion to the occupation, even though withdrawal in late 2021, we see how U.S. militarism and in many cases U.S. journalists themselves are presented as a source of salvation. Afghanistan deserves a better story. And for us here to tell that story from the vantage point of the American empire, we need to be able to re-examine how we've built the narratives around American militarism, its victims, and the so-called war on terror. We need to define the real legacy the United States leaves in Afghanistan, one which is about the horrors of violence and not one about a reluctant savior, a bumbling empire. Welcome to Backspace, where we tell you how the story is told in our headlines, and then we think about how we can tell it differently. The narrative U.S. coverage of Afghanistan loves to repeat, as it often does in coverage of Muslim societies, is about the physical bodies of the women and the violence done against them by their own men, while actively ignoring the role American militarism plays. The Taliban, of course, is, re is responding in the way that it always has, that uh, uh, Osama bin Laden and his associates are uh, guests in their country. Well, it's time for the guests to leave. It is obviously late in the evening in Kabul, <clears throat> and once again, they are finding nighttime very unpleasant. As we drive out the Taliban and the terrorists, we're determined to lift up the people of Afghanistan. The women and children of Afghanistan have suffered enough. Afghan women were, and still are, depicted as simply victims of their men's savagery. They only exist in our headlines when they're being beaten by their own men, denied education by their own men, or when they are killed by their own men. And journalists, of course, have made themselves the voice of Afghan women against their own men. The uh, hidden victims of war and a brutal male-dominated society, a rare look inside the lives of Afghan women and their struggle to survive. The need for female officers is definitely there, but you can imagine the incredible obstacles and taboos that Afghan women have to get through in order to do this kind of work. Violence towards women is not just committed by the Taliban, and it's quite frequent. And in a report released just this year by Human Rights Watch, it stated that nearly 9 out of 10 Afghan women suffer physical, sexual, or psychological violence or forced marriage at least once in their lifetimes. Rarely, if ever, do we hear about how the women of Afghanistan have been impacted by over 20 years of American militarism and occupation. Instead, we see blame placed primarily on culture, on tribes, implying that this violence and hatred of women is simply a part of a rough terrain where men rule and women serve. But how did severe U.S. economic sanctions, which have been used against Afghanistan since 1999, impact women? The healthcare system, maternal healthcare, 
How did over 20 years of American military occupation, drones, war crimes, misuse of funds, and failed institutional building impact the economic, political, and physical well-being of women? U.S. coverage shows us that violence against Afghan women only exists at the hands of their own men and never ours. Ours are there to help. But shouldn't U.S. coverage hold the actions of its government accountable? Shouldn't U.S. coverage look at its government's complicity in worsening conditions for Afghan women? Journalists seemed pretty excited to start the war to save them, but not as much when the time came to hold their own governments accountable. This was nowhere more apparent than in the coverage of the U.S. exit from Afghanistan in August 2021. A long-planned but haphazard violent withdrawal led to a sudden increase in concern and horror amongst American news punditry and reporters about the well-being of Afghan women. With the Taliban in control, Afghanistan's women and girls now find themselves fearing that 20 years of progress will vanish. Afghan women, do you worry that they were abandoned by the United States, essentially. The most vulnerable are little Afghan girls. What are you hearing? Are Afghan girls able to get out? Many American journalists seemed shocked that 20 years of well-documented corruption and destabilization didn't result in Afghanistan turning into a liberal Western democracy, that it fell apart so quickly. We saw blame put on President Joe Biden for failing the people, and specifically the women of Afghanistan, by leaving them at the mercy of the Taliban. Did you get the sense that President Biden cared about the fate of Afghan women? I don't think so. He said U.S. could not be the police of the world to protect women in any other country. If there was a frustration by President Biden that staying wasn't going to help things, we've now seen that leaving can make things worse. Many journalists began to see themselves as saviors, imperfect but saviors nevertheless, taking up the responsibility of demanding that something be done to protect Afghan women. And then there was the glorification of American militarism. We were inundated with feel-good stories, tweets, and photos about U.S. soldiers and Afghan children, where the occupier was, again, portrayed as a savior and ultimately a good-hearted person because they were on our side. They represent us. This is what American troops were doing before terrorists struck today. Feeding children, playing with kids, lending an arm to the elderly. The American military is the greatest in the world, not only because of its superior force, but because of its humanity. Now, compare that to what felt like silence from the same American newsrooms once it began to be reported that over 23 million Afghans were facing mass starvation, with only 2% of the population having the means to feed themselves sufficiently, that the winter was about to claim countless lives. But that level of devastation wasn't from a natural disaster. We knew a famine was approaching in Afghanistan as early as March 2021. The famine has been made a lot worse by Joe Biden's decision to freeze $7 billion in assets from Afghanistan's central bank. That was justified as a way to coerce the Taliban, which retook the country as the U.S. withdrew, into meeting U.S. and European demands. In one of the few instances where the connection was made between the frozen money and the devastation it caused, The Intercept's Austin Allman detailed what the U.S. move has actually meant, that it's kept Afghans from withdrawing their own money, that teachers and government workers are unable to receive their salaries, that the impact the freeze has had on the import-export trade is devastating the economy. Most coverage doesn't actually connect the dots between the U.S. decision to freeze funds and the humanitarian crisis. If it did, the picture would show a starvation campaign waged by the United States on the country it supposedly went to war to save. Usually, the frozen funds are buried deep into articles that offer little context beyond painting the Taliban as primarily to blame for the hunger. The framing makes it seem like freezing the money was the logical thing to do, to stop the money from getting into the hands of the Taliban. The United States continues to face difficult fundamental questions about how it might be able to make reserve funds available to directly benefit the people of Afghanistan with, while ensuring that the funds do not benefit the Taliban. It can be spun any way, but that won't change the fact that by freezing those assets, the United States enacted a policy of mass starvation. And yet, there seems to be less media concern about Afghan women and girls having enough food to eat than there is about what clothes they have to wear.
Take the Wall Street Journal, for example. Between August 1st, 2021 and February 16th of this year, the journal posted over a dozen articles, podcasts, and videos about the dangers facing Afghan women from Afghan men and from the Taliban. And articles and podcasts on the famine and the starvation facing millions of Afghans? A handful. Even then, reports weren't framed around the direct impact of the U.S. freeze. Coverage in the New York Times follows a similar suit, where stories about Afghan women outnumber those specifically about the deteriorating situation in Afghanistan and the U.S. role in exacerbating it. Now, on February 11th, President Joe Biden made the announcement that the $7 billion would finally be unfrozen, but it wouldn't be given back to Afghans. Instead, half of it would be given in aid, meaning distributed by U.S.-approved organizations. The other half? The Biden administration has decided that it will keep the money for itself, putting it in a compensation fund for victims of 9-11, meaning further punishment for a crime that Afghanistan never committed but has paid for for two decades, meaning Afghans are paying reparations to citizens of the richest country in the world while they are being starved. But Sana, can we really talk about Afghanistan differently? Are you saying we can't talk about Afghan women? This is sounding like whataboutism and Taliban apologia to me. We absolutely can, should, be talking about Afghanistan completely differently. Demands for more humane and honest reporting that holds American war crimes and occupation accountable can be uncomfortable for many. It is, after all, easier to frame the United States ultimately as good but bumbling and just blame the scary brown-bearded Muslim men for everything that's gone wrong. So where do we start? How can we as journalists talk about Afghanistan, especially in its current situation, in a way that is humane and honest? We start with defining the actual legacy of the U.S. war in Afghanistan, and we begin that with the violence that is at its heart. Instead of using this moment following the U.S. exit to earnestly self-reflect on the criminal excesses of the war, on the toll it took on the people of Afghanistan, the American media collectively erased 20 years of history and rewrote the narrative to make the U.S. into a restrained savior. The U.S. presence in Afghanistan didn't begin in 2001, but that's a good day to start. The single greatest source of violence in Afghanistan over the last 20 years comes from the presence of U.S. war and occupation. Rural Afghanistan, which is where the majority of Afghans lived, has been devastated by the occupation, which has seen drone air wars claim many lives, including of men and boys who have been indiscriminately and without contention or evidence labeled enemy combatants. Then there is the question of violence against women in Afghanistan. There are cruel realities for Afghan women. Our job isn't to deny that. Our coverage, however, needs to take into account how 40 years of war and 20 years of military occupation creates a culture of violence, what it does to a society. When violence is normalized at every major level, then it is normalized in the most private of spaces as well. Generations of Afghans, boys and girls, men and women, have gone through four decades of horrific violence, often related to foreign invasions, which disrupts not only institutions, but also a country's cultural fabric and its interpersonal relationships. When we chalk everything up to, that's their culture, we have removed any and all responsibility of our government and 20 years of context we, as the media, are also responsible for because of the dehumanizing coverage of the people of Afghanistan. Another way of reckoning with the U.S. legacy in Afghanistan is to be clear that there was no nation building, just like there was no saving of women or building of democracy. What we continue to refer to as a nation building project, creating institutions to better the day-to-day lives of Afghans, was actually billions of dollars pumped unchecked into the hands of corrupt Afghan government officials, Northern Virginia defense contractors, warlords, or it just disappeared. Then there's talking to Afghans, not just those with families who worked with past governments or those who have worked with the U.S. military as contractors or those who live in Kabul. Afghanistan is home to over 38 million people, 74% of whom live in rural areas. Yet interviews with Afghans focus on major city centers or the diaspora. And when the U.S. war in particular has disproportionately impacted Afghans in rural areas, shouldn't they be at the center of the stories? I have to say that there is good reporting from many U.S. journalists. 
Their work, while functioning as the exception to how mainstream U.S. media has covered Afghanistan, offers that better and honest coverage that reckons with this country's legacy of violence is possible. Now, there's a lot more we can put in here, and we will. One of our upcoming episodes will be about how the U.S. media covers so-called terrorism. The envisioning of the U.S. legacy in Afghanistan as a bumbling savior is rooted in a bigger story of how the U.S. media covers and engages with the myths propelled by the war on terror. Because that's the other thing about covering the war in Afghanistan. It doesn't exist in just the context of 20 years of military occupation. Coverage of all wars, special ops, or whatever we want to call U.S. militarism abroad over the last two decades, has been built on deeply rooted assumptions and imaginings of Muslims, Muslim societies, and about how American violence, while it makes mistakes, is ultimately good violence. Like so many other societies in this world, Afghanistan doesn't have a single story to tell. But we as journalists living in the United States can hold this country accountable for the many stories it has denied the Afghan people. The many stories it's cut short. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. This was a quicker turnaround for us because we wanted to make sure that we're able to provide you with some tools for understanding what the coverage of Afghanistan is looking like right now. There's a lot we didn't even scratch the surface of, but we will be exploring a lot of it in a deeper dive on the coverage of so-called terrorism and the war on terror in one of our upcoming episodes. Also, do you want us to do quicker, shorter pieces reacting to what's going on? Let me know because I do, in fact, read the comments. I see exactly what you're saying.